Carol Ann Riddell, and this is Science in You. This month, we're going to take a look at some stories from our past featuring cutting edge advances in medicine and health. The ongoing measles outbreak across the country has once again sparked debate about children and vaccines. We asked Dr. Max Gomez to help us separate fact from fiction. Okay. It's a disturbing sight, a young child so sick with whooping cough she can barely breathe. It's an image almost no one born after the 1950s has ever seen, when whooping cough, or pertussis, struck more than 120,000 children a year in this country. Most of the children who got it uh, before we had antibiotic therapy died. Even with antibiotic therapy, they can be severely impaired. But whooping cough is more than 90% preventable with a vaccine. So are 13 other childhood diseases, ranging from chickenpox and measles to terrifying polio and diphtheria. Vaccines are arguably the most important public health development in the past century. In a recent study using very large data sets that were done uh, at, uh, in Pittsburgh that estimate that vaccines uh, have probably saved more than 100 million lives. There's no question that vaccines have, uh, have really changed the course of history by preserving health. So what accounts for the vocal anti-vaccine movement, often led by celebrities like Jim Carrey and Jenny McCarthy? The biggest fear for many has been that vaccines somehow trigger or cause autism. The culprit was said to be the mercury preservative in vaccines, called thimerosal. The theory has been extensively studied and discredited in a variety of ways. Mercury was taken out of vaccines in Western Europe by 1991, and the incidence of autism only increased. Same thing's true here. We took it out of vaccines essentially by the year 2000, and the incidence of autism only increased. I mean, if you look at those data, you would say, let's put mercury back in vaccines so we can lower the incidence of autism. It's been estimated that if you took all of the mercury in all of the vaccines that a child would have received, that it's less than the amount of mercury in a can, the amount of mercury in a can of tuna fish. So uh, we're talking about remarkably minuscule amounts. Still, many parents remained unconvinced, claiming religious or personal belief exemptions from mandatory vaccinations. In some parts of Los Angeles, where these exemptions are common, a study by the Hollywood Reporter newspaper found vaccination rates in line with immunization rates in developing countries like Chad and South Sudan. The result has been outbreaks of previously contained diseases like measles and whooping cough. The rationale given by many of these objecting parents is that the recommended vaccine schedule of 26 childhood inoculations can overwhelm a young immune system, leading to autism and other developmental derangements. Again, a fear not based in science. We have trillions of bacteria that live on our surfaces, our skin, our intestines, to which we make an immune response. We make grams of immunoglobulins every day to handle that enormous challenge that we get from our environment. Vaccines are really a blip on the screen. They're trivial compared to what you encounter and manage every day. The immune system is remarkably robust. It's capable of handling enormous numbers of exposures. Uh, I'd go so far as to say uh, in the first year of attending daycare, one is exposed to far more antigens uh, than one's ever going to experience from, from vaccines through, through a lifetime. So then what accounts for the fear of vaccines? Some experts say it's actually a lack of fear. Paralytic polio, chickenpox, measles, rubella, and whooping cough are diseases rarely, if ever, seen by modern-day parents. You didn't have to convince my parents to, to, to get vaccines. They were children of the 20s and 30s. They saw diphtheria as a common killer of teenagers. You didn't have to convince me or people my age to get vaccinated. I had a lot of these diseases. But my children, who were you know, 19 and 22, not only don't see these diseases today, they didn't grow up with these diseases. So for them, I think vaccination is a matter of faith. Dr. Max says it's important to remember childhood vaccines do not lead to autism or developmental delays. They do prevent serious illness and disability. And the consensus among pediatricians, scientists, and public health experts is clear. You should vaccinate your children. Each year, experts are learning more about breast cancer and ways to combat the disease. I met an expert who's working on cutting-edge research to help patients fight the disease with their own immune system. Breast cancer survivor Marjorie Schwartz knows exactly what it feels like in those days following diagnosis. My own cancer was found uh, on a sonogram. 
I did not know what to do. Like almost every other woman, I was totally overwhelmed. That was eight years ago. Now Marjorie works with other women through the support organization SHARE. She encourages them to do their research because so much has changed when it comes to treating breast cancer. They feel like uh, a bomb has been dropped into their lives, and of course a bomb has been dropped into their lives, but we urge them to take the time to figure out their diagnosis and not act too quickly so that they do the right thing. Each woman really has to figure out her own pathology with her doctor and chart a course that's very individualized, much more so than it has ever been in the past. Heather MacArthur, a breast cancer doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, explains why an individualized approach is so important. Breast cancer is not a single disease. Just as though each individual on planet Earth is unique and different, um, each tumor is unique and different. Dr. MacArthur is working on cutting edge research here in immunotherapy. The goal, to train a patient's own immune system to recognize and fight cancer cells so that after the patient's breast cancer is cured, it doesn't come back. What we're doing is combining freezing of the tumor tissue to create tiny little tumor fragments that are more digestible to the immune system because a big lump of tumor tissue is difficult for the immune system to process, but tiny little tumor pieces are much more digestible. So we freeze the tumor with a process called cryoablation, which is just a uh, medical term for freezing, and then administer an immune boosting drug so that uh, an individual can develop a robust immune response to all those individual tumor fragments. In other words, you're not just focusing on one specific feature, you're allowing the thousands, if not millions, of features to present themselves to the immune system with the hope that at a later date, if the body were presented with that information again in the form of a recurrence, that your own immune system would recognize that because it had developed memory and would therefore attack um, any cells that had that information. It almost sounds like the stuff of science fiction, our own bodies taught to recognize and attack our own specific cancer. Dr. MacArthur says the work is part of an ongoing clinical trial and experimental at this point, but she believes in the promise of immunotherapy. My dream is that this becomes standard of care. The only way that we make any advancement in this field, the only way that we move this field forward is through research. A quick update on our story, the work at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center is now part of an ongoing clinical research program, and Marjorie is still very much involved with Cher, celebrating 10 years since her diagnosis. Trying to become pregnant is an emotional time for a couple. Add the challenge of infertility and the stress can be overwhelming. Any type of issue, medical, emotional, or age, can dramatically reduce the probability of pregnancy. In this story from January of 2014, Tina Beth Pina took a closer look at the newest in infertility treatments. She follows several couples through the process. So infertility is the inability to conceive a pregnancy within 12 months of trying. Anybody can suffer from infertility. In fact, about 20% of all couples trying to get pregnant are by definition infertile. The percentage of patients that experience infertility due to a male factor or a female factor is equal. So it's about 40% female, 40% male, and 20% is unexplained. And what exactly is unexplained? It doesn't mean there's not a cause of infertility, it just means that our testing is not able to identify the cause of the infertility. According to the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the specific causes for male and female factor infertility vary. Historically, uh, women were blamed um, for the inability to conceive. We now know that in a large proportion of circumstances, there can be a male factor. And the cornerstone of the evaluation is the semen analysis, um, where we're basically looking at the volume of the seminal fluid, the concentration, the amount of sperm, the motility of the sperm. When you're evaluating the woman, you need to have eggs. So you need to have an assessment of ovulation, um, and you want an assessment of normal ovulatory function. Then there's the anatomy. You need a normal uterus 
or a normal uterine cavity to allow an embryo to implant and continue to grow. You need tubes that are open. The, the, the tube is the location where egg and sperm come in contact with each other. And if there's any blockage, um, that will prevent um, one from, from getting pregnant. Thyroid abnormalities and your age can also be factors. At the age of 34, 32, the chance of having a genetically abnormal embryo with in vitro fertilization, you have to get the embryos out, is around 40%. So 40% of embryos are going to be genetically abnormal even at the, at the youngest ages. At the age of 40, it's around 80% of those, of those eggs are chromosomally abnormal, and at 42, it's over 90%. Women correlate getting their periods to being fertile, and we certainly know that's not true. Infertility, or, or the decline in fertility, happens 10 to 15 years before menopause ever occurs. Age of a man also is important. However, male sperm counts decline, starting with men that are around 35 years of age. But infertility, or sperm function, doesn't decline in men until after the age of 50, usually. So while in women, fertility declines at around 35 in general, uh, that decline is much more rapid and much more pronounced in women than it is in men. While surgery or fertility medications can be effective in some cases, others may require interuterine inseminations, also known as IUIs. If that doesn't work, an in vitro fertilization treatment, or IVF, is performed, where eggs are fertilized by sperm outside of the body. What risks are associated with all types of infertility treatments. The biggest and most obvious risk is um, a higher number of multiple gestations. Twins, triplets, quads, quints. Um, we don't consider a higher order multiple gestation as a success. We consider that a complication. With um, each um, uh, increasing number of fetuses, you increase the risk of complications in the pregnancy to the mother hypertension, preeclampsia, diabetes, preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes. And if these things are occurring to the mother, they're occurring to the baby. Other risks include ovarian hyperstimulation and an increased risk of ovarian cancer if you're taking fertility drugs. Let me put that in perspective. The risk of ovarian cancer, lifetime risk in women is one in 70. If you never have a child, never get pregnant at all, no pregnancy at all, your risk is 3 in 70. So it's a 300% increase in the risk of getting ovarian cancer, just the fact of not having a pregnancy in the past. In women who take the fertility drugs and get pregnant, their risk goes down from 3 in 70 to 1 in 70. The risks of fertility treatment are so low, and the chances of pregnancy are so high, with appropriate treatment in the, again, the appropriate population of women, that the risk certainly are significantly lower than the chance of pregnancy and definitely worth it. Infertility treatments are not a guarantee that you'll get pregnant. And women need to follow the best advice of their doctors. I share in this very experience with many women. After I was diagnosed with unexplained infertility, I underwent five IUIs and three IVFs at two different practices. Sadly, none of the treatments worked for me, but there are many success stories out there. It's just like a feeling you can't explain, just kind of like we finally did it after so long. After three years of fertility treatments and miscarriages, Erica Antonis Gianetta and her husband had a son on their third standard IVF cycle. In the end, I have um, a greater appreciation for my son. The struggle made, made it that much more great. Since this segment aired, the Giannettas got pregnant again, naturally. Blake Scarlett Giannetta joined big brother Bennett, who turns two this year. In a recent story, Mike Gilliam looked at the growing problem of obesity and children, and one pediatrician who is at the forefront of helping kids lose weight. Meet nine-year-old Michael Perlmutter. Early in his young life, he struggled to maintain a healthy weight. This is a picture of him overweight at the beach this summer. But that's all changing now that his family has reached out for help from Dr. Hess. In just two short months, he's had remarkable weight loss. When we first met Dr. Hess, right after Labor Day, Michael weighed 130 pounds. And as of this morning's scale, he weighed 112. How does it feel now, now that you've lost 18 pounds in just a matter of months? 
it feels really easy to run and play like um like I used to be able to be like um when we when my me and my friends played tag I used to be always it cuz I was so heavy, but now it's easy to run. Dr. Hess says the problems Michael experienced are prevalent, even though progress is being made. In New York City, we've implemented um, several changes in the school systems and in the early education programs. So we are seeing a slight decrease in the percentage of obesity in the youngest children in the kindergarten age, four and five year olds. Um, but overall, no, we're not seeing much. It's kind of tabled off. Why is the problem so prevalent in New York City? Well, we have a lot of access to food. Um, we have almost no exercise in elementary schools. Despite the fact that children are supposed to have 60 minutes of exercise, vigorous, uh, moderate to vigorous exercise a day, New York City elementary schools from kindergarten to fifth grade only get 45 minutes of physical education a week. So it's really not a problem of food necessarily. It's a combination. There's a lack of park space, and schools don't have safe places for kids to go outside. So some recess indoors, according to Hess. When I worked in Brooklyn, the school had a gym, but the gym had poles, so they weren't allowed to run because they can crash into a pole. Parents need to recognize if a child is developing a weight problem and act fast. There are several red flags that parents should look out for. So sneak eating, that, they, that the parent finds wrappers, like candy wrappers and, you know, eating huge portions. So you might buy a package of low-fat cheese sticks and keep them in your refrigerator and you'll find six wrappers in the, in the garbage that day because the child ate so many portions of it. So portion distortion is a huge one. When your child is eating two or three portions of dinner at a time, when you know that you gave them appropriate sized dinner. Is there a real problem with yeah. the way people are actually serving food to their children? Yes, so the kids are getting many more calories on their plate than they need. If I show them that a slice of bread should never be more than a CD, um, you know, a portion of meat should never be bigger than the size of a mouse, a computer mouse, um, that they can't have seconds of starches like potatoes, rice, pasta, that they can have seconds only of the vegetables, you know, cooking healthier with less salt and no butter and olive oil. So a lot about the dinner plate and what healthy portions are. And you'll, you'll be amazed. Should they be eating off an adult plate? No, kids should be eating off a child-sized plate, for sure. So a salad plate is perfect for a child. And there's the often talked about problem of kids consuming sugary drinks. Sweet drinks are a huge contributor to pediatric obesity. It's what probably between french fries and sweetened drinks. Those are our two worst enemies. Michael's family adopted many of these techniques, including the exercise. I started doing um, water polo. It's like laps and treading water most of the time. It's really, really hard because um, we pretty much swim laps the whole entire time, and it gets really, really tiring. We've been eating at home more. Uh, rather than eating out or ordering in, we've cut out almost all sweets. We're eating whole gra fewer grains, we're eating whole grains, and I say we because the whole family is doing it. We've all lost a few pounds. Um, we've, um, we limit our red meat, per Dr. Hess's suggestion, to once a week. We ha only have pasta once a week and it's whole grain, and we eat lots of protein. And now the whole family is losing weight with Michael. It's about getting them motivated and lighting that spark. And usually once they start to lose the weight and they see that they can, then it's like, it's like, it's done. It's done. It's, it's the hardest part is the first step. Since that story aired last November, Michael Perlmutter has lost a total of 21 pounds to date and only has nine pounds left to achieve his weight loss goal of 30 pounds. Until fairly recently, taking a holistic approach to patient care was frowned upon by mainstream doctors. However, much of that is changing, as Donna Hanover found out. The center's medical director, Dr. Martin Ehrlich, explains the concept of integrative medicine. It's medicine that integrates all of the wisdom of the various systems of medicine that have been going on for thousands and thousands of years. So Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, indigenous medicine from countries and cultures all over the world. Much of Western medicine is really about pathophysiology. For example, when I go to medical school, when you, you start medical school, the first thing you do is dissect a corpse and spend the year studying disease. Uh, there isn't a course on why 
we're healthy, how we stay healthy. Here at the Mount Sinai Beth Israel Center for Health and Healing, they offer care that includes acupuncture, yoga, Japanese Reiki therapy, meditation, massage, aromatherapy, nutrition education, and physical therapy. They are also primary care doctors and believe Western medicine does have great value. It's fantastic for so many things. Boy, if I go out there and get hit by a car, I want to get the best orthopedist and the best doctor I can to put me back together again. And yet, with all our advances, technological advances, for much of, much of the, the ills of society, much of the chronic diseases, uh, the arthritis and the heart disease, and you know, we, we haven't really those effective treatments. You know, we can put in a bypass and put in a stent, but in three months later, six months later, patients will be back with their next heart attack. For us, in integrative medicine, we like to focus on things that are relatively low-tech, relatively simple, and often under the control of the patient, their diet, uh, their exercise or lack of it, their habits, good or bad. <laughs> There's a lot of root causes that begin in lifestyle that can often play a role in helping to treat people and help them heal or prevent disease. Dr. Ehrlich says the body has a natural inflammatory response that is part of healing where certain molecules rush to attack an infection or invader. But this often causes painful swelling, heat, and redness in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. Inflammation is not so obvious but very damaging in type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Inflammation turns out to be a really common factor that underlies almost all chronic diseases. Dr. Ehrlich says studies have shown that many patients who meditate reduce the level of inflammatory molecules in their blood as well as their heart rate and blood pressure. Meditation can also help patients who need relief from pain. John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts back in 1970 started a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction that taught people, people to meditate, to relax, to breathe, People from all sorts of departments would send their patients from pain, from oncology, from cardiology, because they, they had done everything they could with these patients and they, they were either still in pain or they just weren't progressing. That eight week course turned out to be incredibly successful for almost anybody who came, whether they had irritable bowel syndrome or whether they had chronic pain, they would improve. We do that here. We have courses all year long. It's one of my most commonly uh, common prescriptions for patients, you know, and it's powerful. Dr. Ehrlich is trained in acupuncture and believes that some non-Western medicine works by affecting the thin membrane throughout the body known as myofascial tissue. This myofascial tissue, this stuff that we don't really understand very well, that covers all our organs, that covers our muscles, and connects and sends messages all over. Besides what is offered at the Center for Health and Healing, Dr. Ehrlich says there is evidence to support other healing modalities like pet and music therapy. Are there any of these uh, wacky things that you've heard about that you really want to say to people, don't do that, or uh, bring that to your doctor before you start doing that? I'll have patients that come in here with two shopping bags full of supplements, you know? Um, and sometimes my job is to like get them to put their supplements away. Vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin A, um, those supplements can build up to toxic levels without people knowing about it. Mm -hmm. That certainly is something that I see not infrequently. Doctors who practice solely Western medicine send him patients who want to try integrative medicine in hopes of avoiding surgery or drugs. Really a more inclusive medicine that looks at the entire potential that we have uh, to help people heal. The Mount Sinai Beth Israel Center for Health and Healing is currently involved in several clinical trials involving alternative healing methods. Well, at one point or another, many of us have thought about tracking down the elusive fountain of youth. Ernabel DeMillo found a cutting edge medical spa using lasers and ultrasound to lead the way. From lasers, to ultrasounds, 
Physicians like Dr. Mitchell Chasen have found a way to make 60 look like 45 and 45 look like 35. Not only are we pausing the aging process, we're actually reversing the aging process. We understand more of the factors that cause aging. And generally in the skin, they're related to sun exposure, heredity, and the environment. And that's what 58-year-old Barbara Bailey would like to do, reverse years of skin damage and aging. I think it's a wonderful thing as long as you don't do too much. Uh, I think you have to be a little careful because, you know, we can all get carried away. But I think to reverse the aging process to a point is a wonderful thing. That's the bone right there. Americans want to look young. According to the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, close to 10 million cosmetic procedures were performed in 2010. And while the numbers are going up, the patients are getting younger. Jana Wright just turned 30 and is already having treatments done to stay youthful. It just made sense for me. I'm healthy in so many other ways. Why wouldn't I do that? And if I can pause it or at least slow it down dramatically, I would like to. And it is science that has changed the landscape of cosmetic surgery. Powerful and smarter lasers mean less downtime and fewer complications. First came Fraxel, a laser that uses fractional energy to treat skin cells at any one point. The newest device is called E-Prime, which literally reinflates sunken, hollow skin while tightening it. For the first time ever, doctors can deliver laser energy exactly where they want it. Most laser technologies are delivered through the skin. The problem with that is that we may lose some of the energy as the energy is transmitted through the skin. We also have to worry about damaging the surface of the skin. The E-Prime, we're delivering the energy directly into the deep layers of the skin. And not only are we delivering the energy exactly where we want it, but the computer is assessing how much energy, what temperature we have deep down in the skin, and it's feeding back and making changes, and that leads to safety. It may not be the fountain of youth, but thanks to science, we are getting closer every day. That's our show for today. Next month, we take a closer look at our environment and how research and people are showing the way to a better world for all of us. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. Thanks for joining us for Science and You.